All right, uh, welcome to Rampart Christian Fellowship. Today is October 25th, 2015, and we are in a series of messages titled The Attributes of God. This is part nine, and today we're going to be talking about the Trinity, probably the most amazing attribute of God. You know, I was thinking about doing this, this attribute of God probably earlier, but it was important to get through the, the omnis, which we just went through the past three messages, the omnipresence, the omnipotence, and the, and the omniscience of God, because that all has to do with the Trinity and, and how it, the, those three uh, um, omni attributes only make sense in light of God being a triune, eternal crea uh, creator God. So, um, the attributes of God, uh, it, this whole series, uh, all I wanted to do is, is kind of highlight, you know, what, what, who God is, what God's all about, so that way, the greater our understanding of God, you know, the bigger God gets, the smaller our problems and the things of this world become. And I believe that to know God is to know truth, and the more we understand about God, the better equipped we will be to serve God. So in this series, we will explore in depth the attributes of God so that we might be a, a gain a better understanding of our purpose in God. And uh, there's, there's a lot of other resources that you can look into if you want to even get to, to know God more. Um, the Attributes of God is also a series done by Stephen, La Stephen Lawson at Legionnaire.org. There's a book Arthur Pink wrote called The Attributes of God. This is a, a subject that, that is worthy of all of some energy and some research because it really does change your life when you, when you learn more about God. And so this, this, uh, this part of the series, part nine, we're talking about the Trinity. And uh, on, the, on the notes I put E Pluribus Unum, which means out of the, uh, the many comes one. And it's on all the coins. It's also, the, if, you, if you heard the, you know, you've, you've heard of university, well, that's, uh, the, the, the root words for university is unity and diversity. So the idea of ye pluribus unum, out of the many come one, out of unity and di di diversity, the, 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 there's a diversity of persons in one unified being. And so the concept of the Trinity is the, one of the great mysteries of the Christian faith. And it's hard to even get a human understanding of how uh, uh, we have one God that exists in three persons. The Bible teaches that there is one God who exists in three distinct persons. And this concept is impossible for, for, the, for our limited human mind to fully comprehend. God is infinitely greater than, than finite man. And so, and so it is difficult for us to grasp God's true nature without divine revelation. See, God has revealed to us in his word who he is and, and, how, and, uh, and what he is like and, and how he manifests himself in, in, uh, in three persons. And so, but, but it also, the Bible specifically states that God is one. And so, so we, must, we must come to an understanding and it's usually by faith. You know, it, some people say, I'm not going to believe it till I see it. But in Christianity, if you want to see it, you must believe it. So you believe, and, and then God will reveal it to you, and then you will see. Because so, you know, someone say God is, God is one God, but he exists in three persons. And, and you know, some people who, who don't really, you know, who just accept that as a child would accept it. You just tell them what it is, and they'll say, okay, that's what it is. But for many people, it's just, they, they try and understand it and, it, and it, and it can drive some people mad when, when they try and think about how is God three persons in one. Now, I think of the, the mathematical equation one to the third power. That's one times one times one equals one. <laughs> and it's all 100% one, but it still equals out to one. But, but it's still, any, any ex examples that we give, and I'm going to give a few today, of how we can, uh, illustrations rather, on how we can kind of understand the Trinity, they're still going to be limited to what our, our human minds can kind of understand. So they're not going to do uh, God uh, justice, really. It's not going to really get, get the whole idea, but I'm going to attempt to. But let us look at what God has revealed about himself through his word first. So let's hope, hopefully we can gain a functional understanding of, his, of this magnificent attribute, uh, the Trinity, through his word. Amen? So... Let's open up our Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. We talked about this verse last week. 
but it's important to note. And uh, so Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And you might ask, well, what does that have to do with the Trinity? Because it seems like God was there and he created the earth. But the, you have to go back to the original language. See, see, what we believe at Rampart Christian Fellowship is that the Bible is, is absolutely inerrant. It means it doesn't have any errors in it. It's completely divinely inspired in the original language. And a lot of times when you, when you take it from the original language and you bring it to the English language or any other language, you'll lose a little bit of something in the translation from the original language. So we, it, the Old Testament was, was uh, written in ancient Hebrew and the New Testament was written in Greek and there's a couple other parts that, that were written in Aramaic. But, but uh, in the original language for Genesis 1.1, it says in the beginning, God. Now that word for God in the original language is Elohim. Elohim is, is, is a plural, it's, it's an actual plural tense. So it's, it's weird how in the beginning God, this plural being, created the heavens and the earth. And uh, if you, also, uh, like I highlighted on the top of the notes, Genesis 1.26 says, this is when God is creating, he created the, the, all the firmament and, and then the waters and then the earth. He, he brought forth the grass in verse 11 and, and all the trees. And then he brought for, forth all the beings. I mean, all the animals. And then in verse 26, it says, And then God said, and then Elohim said, um, in verse 26, uh, Then God said, Let us, plural, make man in our image according to our likeness. And that's very interesting. So, so God, in the plural, says, Let us make man in our image. If we, go, if we keep flipping through the Bible, if we go to... Um, Deuteronomy, this is uh, Deuteronomy is covering Moses and the, and the different um, uh, commands that God gave to the children of Israel. And uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, this is what's called the Shema, the, 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 uh, the, the Jewish prayer to God. In, in, in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And that's why, and, that, and there's, there's, there's a little tension between Jews and Christians because we say we both serve the same God, the Father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but, but they insist that God the Father is, is one God and he does not have, there is no uh, trinity to him. So, so there's an argument between Jews and Christians because in Deuteronomy 6.4 it says, Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. But you got to understand, when when Moses was bringing the law to the to the Israelites, he wanted to set set himself apart. It, God wanted to set himself apart from all the other nations that were that were around at the time, like the Egyptians and the and the Midianites and all all the, the different and they worshipped many gods, and uh, and 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 so instead of. Um, uh, polytheism, which is a multitude of gods, God wanted to say, "We are monotheism. We are one God." It, the hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Amen. And so, if we keep going, though, in the Old Testament, if we go to the book, the, to the prophets, the prophet Isaiah specifically, Isaiah had a vision one time in, in Isaiah chapter six, and he had a vision of the throne room of God, and it says. When uh, in, in the beginning of, of Isaiah chapter 6, it says, in the, ki in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And it describes how magnificent it was when, when Isaiah saw the Lord. But in Isaiah 6, 8, it says, And then also I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom will go for me? No, whom will go for us? It says it in verse 8 of, of Isaiah chapter 6. It says, who will go for us? And again, it's giving this plural tense to, to, the, to the person of God, which is, which is interesting. And if you, if, you, if you step a little further in the book of Isaiah chapter, or Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, this was a, a verse that, that Jesus quoted when he started to preach. 
And, and it says in, in Isaiah 61.1, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. For, uh, for he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prison to those who are bound. And so right there, when Jesus preaches that in the synagogue, he, he says that this day, this, this scripture is fulfilled in me. So when Jesus, uh, the Son of God, preaches this, this text to the Jews 2,000 years ago, he says the Spirit of the Lord, that's the Holy Spirit, of the Lord God, of, of, of God the Father, is upon me. And so you see all three in the Trinity uh, described in one spot right there. And then if we step further, a little, a little further into this, again with Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God, if you go to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. So this is where Jesus is getting, is, is getting baptized by John the Baptist. And, and, and this, is, this is what it says. And, and then in, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, it says, When he had been baptized, talking about Jesus, came up immediately, immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descend like a, like a dove uh, um, and alighting upon him. And then in verse 17, it says, And suddenly a voice from heaven uh, uh, came, say, uh, came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So right there you have the Father, the, the, uh, God the Father speaking, and, and, and God the Holy Spirit descending, and, and, and God the Son being baptized. And you have all three parts of the Trinity right there expressed in, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And then if you go to the end of the book of, uh, book of Matthew, in Matthew 28, Matthew 28, verse 19. This is when Jesus is sending out, uh, he, it's just called the Great Commission. And we'll start in verse 18. And, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. In verse 19 it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, and see what it says, baptizing them in the name, singular, of who? Of the Father? No, of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. So the singular name of the three persons of God. And so I believe that right there is, the, is probably the best example of how God expresses himself in three persons, but he, but he claims there's one name, there's one God. And, that, and, it looks, and, it's, and it's that way in the original text, in the original Greek uh, that was inspired by God. So, so you have it right there, Jesus himself saying, go and baptize people in the singular name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So, so and it's a very interesting and compelling thing. So, and I don't, and that's why it's one of the great mysteries of the Christian faith, because we, we need to believe that God is able to, to express himself in three distinct persons that are not they're, they're, they, they are distinct, meaning they're, they're separate from one another, but at the same time, they, they all categorically fit as God. So they are, they are all God. God the Father is not God the Son, God the, God, uh, and God the Son is not the Holy Spirit. They, they are distinct from each other, but they are all God. Um, if we go to uh, John chapter 1, this is another... This is another interesting piece of scripture. I mean, just when, just from the plain reading of it, you just open your, open up a Bible to John chapter one. As long as it's not the New World Translation that the Jehovah's Witnesses read, John chapter one, verse one. This is what it says. It says, "In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God." And if you if you jump jump down to to verse. 14, it says, and then the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So in the beginning, in the, in the very beginning, just like we read in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning the earth was out form and void. And also in, in Genesis 1.1, it says the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So there's the spirit, there's God the Father, and then it, you'll see in John here, Jesus was there. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And, the, and then in verse 14 it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God became flesh and dwelt among us. And so th this is the whole crazy thing about the Trinity, that God is, 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 
an eternal being that was not created. He did not come into existence. He has always existed. And, and from eternity past to eternity future, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were there. They have always been there. And they have expressed perfect unity within the diversity, which is the Trinity. Amen? If we jump ahead to John chapter 16, verse 13 and 14. This is another very... Uh, important uh, picture we get. John chapter 16 verses 13 and 14 says, however, or however, when he, the spirit of truth, so, or let's go back to verse 12. I, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot hear them now. And in this is Jesus talking to his disciples in, in, in John chapter 16. And it says, how, and Jesus says, however, when he, a person, right? Because a lot of people will say the Holy Spirit is just like a force or this kind of mystical entity that doesn't have, that's not really a person. It's just like part of the Spirit of God. But what does it say? What does it say right there in John chapter 16? It says, however, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own, own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you the things to come. And he, so he's, he's using this, this masculine pronoun for the spirit of God, the spirit of truth. And so the, that, that's one thing we need to understand, that the Holy Spirit is an actual person of the Trinity, of, of God. And he is fully God. And then the, uh, another one I have for you is in Colossians, a couple verses in the book of Colossians, which, which makes some pretty awesome statements about who God is and his, and his attributes. Um, Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 talks about Jesus and, and so we need to know that Jesus Christ is God so what does it say about Jesus in, in, in Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 it says he speaking about Jesus is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation that's Jesus that's talking about He's the image of who? The invisible God. How, if, you, if you're not God, you cannot be the image of the invisible God. And so that's, that's in Colossians 1.15, that's what it says about Jesus Christ. And then if you go to the next chapter, Colossians chapter 2, uh, in verse 9, it says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead, bodily. So, so, in Jesus Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead, which means the, the divine nature of God, and it all dwells within Jesus Christ. So you need to know that the Holy Spirit is a person and is God. You need to know that Jesus Christ is a person and he is also 100% God. And, and the crazy thing about Jesus Christ is he is 100% man and 100% God. That's called the hypostatic union. And how does that work? Well, we don't know. We are, we are only human in nature. So, so it, the, the, that's what the Bible describes to us. And so what, God, what, God, what does God want us to do? Well, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible is Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge God in all your ways and he will direct your path. So if I'm trusting in God with all of my heart and I'm not leaning on my own understanding, I'm just reading what the word says and I'm trusting in it. When, it. when it says that Jesus Christ, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead, and it says the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will tell you. So it's talking about a personal, I mean, a, a masculine pronoun for the Holy Spirit. You've got to understand that the Holy Spirit is God, Jesus Christ is God, and God the Father is God. And they are all one. And, and they are diversity in, in perfect unity. And that's an amazing thing. And, and, and it can drive some people crazy. But I, but I encourage you, if you just trust God in it and you just have the faith of a child and you accept that in your heart and, and, you, and you start to acknowledge God for who he is, it will drastically change your life. So finally, how does, all, how does God being this triune being, like it depicts in the Bible, how does, how does God being a trinity, well, how does that apply to my life? What, is that, what difference does that make? Well, the concept of the Trinity is, is absolutely vital to being a Christian. I, I, I have to say this, if, if you don't believe that God, that, well, specifically Jesus Christ is God, the deity of Jesus Christ. If you don't accept Jesus Christ for who he is, 100% God, then I don't believe that you can actually be saved. 
And so that rules out. I mean, I know that the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, they say that Jesus Christ is the son of Elohim. But he's a create, they, they think that he is a created being that was born out of a celestial marriage between Elohim and one of his wives. <laughs> and so there's a whole different thing there with what the Mormons believe and what we believe that Jesus Christ is the eternal creator God. And he has always existed. He is not a created being. And why does that matter? Well, one day we are going to, going to stand before God. So we must acknowledge God for who he is, who he has revealed himself to be. Or we run, run the risk of follow, following false doctrines and heresies. And if, if, if uh, let's go ahead and turn there. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 something very, very important that, that, that we should all take very seriously. So Matthew chapter 7, let's start in verse 13. It says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life, and few will find it. In verse 15 it says, Beware the false prophets who come in sheep's clothing, and inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even, even so... Every good tree get, bears good fruit, and every bad tree bears bad fruit. Bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear good bear good fruit, bear bad fruit. Nor can a good a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that bear, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. In verse twenty one, and this is this is very important. In verse twenty one of chapter seven of the book of Matthew, it says, and Jesus says this: Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And in verse 22 it says, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not uh, prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and, and done many wonders in your name? And what, look what Jesus says to him in verse 23. It says, Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. That word in the Greek, gnosko, it, it, it talks about an intimate knowing. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So there is, Jesus paints the picture of the day of judgment. And he gives a warning. Enter by the narrow gate. Because there's false prophets out there teaching all kinds of things. And he says that, that, that people were going to say to him, Oh, I know Jesus. I believed in Jesus. I cast out demons. I went to church. I did all these things. But he says, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. It, Jesus is going to declare to many people who say, I know Jesus, that he's going to say, I never knew you. And I, I, and I believe that one of the things that will, will, will incur that reaction from Jesus is if you, you don't acknowledge him for who he is. He is the judge of judges, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And if, you, and if you're going to take Jesus off the throne and make him something less than God, then I believe he will just declare to you, I never knew you and you never knew me. Depart from me. And, 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 and in verse 24, he says, Jesus says, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And in verse 26, he says, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house and it fell and great was its fall. And, and so Jesus said these things to, to give us a warning. We need to acknowledge him for who he is. We need to not only know Jesus, but make sure that Jesus knows us. And we need to, to God re, uh, reveals that through the Holy Spirit that, that comes to live inside of us when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And so there's, there's this whole thing that we put our, our faith in Jesus Christ... And then we get filled with the Holy Spirit, and then we honor God the Father. It says, it, it, what does it say um, in Matthew chapter 5? It says, it says uh, let's see, Matthew chapter 5, teach, Jesus is teaching about uh, the fruits of the Spirit. And he says, go therefore, uh, rejoice exceedingly glad. You are the salt of the earth. Salt does not abide forever and is thrown out. You are the light of the world as a city set on a hill. And in verse, verse 16, what does it say? It says, let your light so shine before men that may, they may see your good works and glorify who? Your Father who is in heaven. So, so and how, how are we going to glorify our Father who is in heaven? By putting our faith in Jesus Christ, being filled with the Holy Spirit, and then we go and, let, and see men, or, uh, go and do good works that men can see that they give, give glory to God. Amen? 
So there's a whole thing. That, 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 that Everything to be a Christian has to do with God being this triune God that exists in three distinct persons. And that's how, how we walk it out. So now I wanted to give you a couple of, uh, well, this, this is, this is a, a popular image and it describes God as the Trinity. And so you see God the Father is God. God the Son is God. And God the Spirit is God. And then you see the circle around. Father is not Spirit. Spirit is not Son. And Son is not Father. They are separate, but they are unified in, in, one, in, in the one categorical understanding of they are all God. But they are distinct in, in their personhood. So you've got to understand there's a distinction between the person of God and or in the category the, or the persons of each person uh, person in the Trinity, and then the actual category, which is God. Amen. And then I wanted to give you give you guys a few illustrations. Now understand this: that these illustrations are very limited, and 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 as far as completely giving us a good example of who God is, but they they kind of help our human minds to understand things. Now one I like. But it's very, but it's very dangerous, and I'll explain why. Is the water example? It's, water is solid, liquid, and gas. Three different stages, but it's all H2O, so it's always water. And but you got to be careful with this illustration because you can be led into a heresy, like I talked about before, which is called modalism, which may, like some some Christians or some some churchgoers believe that God changes modes so it's only one god but it, he's he's jesus at one time he changes mode to father and then he changes mode to spirit and so he's never all three at one time but and so that's why you got to be careful of the of the water of the water illustration because at all times god is god and it, regardless of how how he's expressing himself and which person he uh, he's expressing him, himself as he is always 100 percent god Jesus is 100% God, and, and they, they exist at the same time. Another, another very simple illustration is a triangle. Uh, this is an equilateral triangle. And you, you can see just, a, just a, a basic example of who God is by looking at a triangle. Now, if you take away one of the sides of the triangle, it's no longer a triangle. And in the same way, if you take away God the Father, then it's no longer, then it's no longer God. If you take away God the Son... It's no longer God. And so as a, tri as a triangle needs all three sides to maintain its, its category as a triangle, God, the Trinity, needs all th requires all three sides to maintain its, its category as God, or his category as God. Amen? And then another one I like is a human being. A human being is a, is a, is a trichotomy, another, a, another trinity of sorts. And, and like we read... In, in Genesis chapter 1, God said, let us create man in, in our image, according to our likeness. And so a human being is body, mind, and spirit, or body, soul, and spirit. And the soul can, consists of the mind, the will, and the emotions. And so the non-corporal, but it's the, it's the active part of, of a person. And I believe a person's spirit actually influences their soul, their mind, will, and emotions. And as, as you're... As your spirit is connected to God, then, then all these things, your soul and your body, will, will, will be affected. But, but as a human being, you are, are, are a trinity of sorts. You, you are a mind, body, and soul. And, or mind, body, and spirit. And so, and so God created us this way so that we can, so that we can be in community uh, in the same way that God is in community. I don't know if you've ever talked to yourself or you know, had, a, you know, had an argument with yourself in your head. In the same way, God uh, has created us this way because we have everything that, that, the, that the God has given to us in our, in our finite bodies. So it's still, all, like I said, all these examples or illustrations are, are weak comparisons or weak illustrations when we think about the eternal God. And that's why I wanted to close with this verse, Romans chapter 11, verse 33 and 34. It says, Oh, the depth of the riches of uh, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his uh, judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? So that, that's the Apostle Paul. And he's just crying out for the, for, for the unknowable nature of God. 
You know, it, it's amazing how God can, can reveal himself the way he has. But I, but I trust you, if, if you put your faith in God and you trust in him with all your heart and you embrace him for who he has revealed himself to be, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and you, and you invite him, uh, or you, you, you submit your life to him, and you, and you surrender your life to him, I promise you, you will not regret it, and you, your life will be permanently changed from now to eternity. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, you are so good, and, and your mysteries are so far beyond our limited understanding, Lord. I pray that you would just continue to draw us near to you, that you would, um, that you would just oh, expand our understanding, expand our minds, and build our faith. That we, that we would know you better so that we might glorify you in this life. We pray for all those that are running around lost in this world, that, that they are they're trapped by the limits of their understanding, that all they see is the darkness of the world. We pray that you would shine your light into their lives by any means necessary. We thank you for the time that you've given us. We praise you for your, for your grace and, and all that you've done. And we, we, when we look forward to the hope of seeing you face to face on that glorious day. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah.